Hello, everybody. So um, this lecture is going to be on fire as an ecological process. And what we're really going to focus on is just um, kind of the theories about how fire was viewed in terms of the environment. And then after that, we're really going to focus on the idea of what attributes go into a fire regime and really help um, kind of define a fire regime. So, um, when thinking about this topic, um, Heinzelman, who uh, in 1981 came up with a fire regime system that uh, in some places still used today, uh, had this had this quote, and uh, I think it's it's really important. Removing fire from ecosystems would be among the greatest upsets in the environmental system that man could impose, possibly among the most severe stresses since the evolution of fire-dependent biota evolved. I cannot predict the outcome, but a fundamental reordering of the relationships between all plants and animals and their environments would occur. Many species could be lost through extinction. And what this speaks to is the idea uh, that fire is a part of the ecosystem, almost similar to a keystone species. Um, which if any of you have taken my natural resource class is something that we uh, discuss in detail and the idea of a trophic cascade. And I think with fire, you see similar ideas. And so how does fire fit? What is fire's role in the ecosystem um, if, it's, if it's this important, if it's fundamental to how everything exists? And out here in California, I think we can see that much more than other places. Not everywhere is fire a keystone species, but here in California with what we consider to be the vegetation of California and the, the typical look of California, it is a keystone species in my mind and should be viewed as such. So let's st first start with basic ecological theory, and I'm not going to sit there in the... There, that's a little bit easier. All right. So with basic ecological theory, fire is a defining part of the ecosystem. They know that. But the dynamic nature and complexity of fire um, in this state is enhanced by topography, climate, and vegetation. So it becomes um, really complicated because we have, we have this climatic pattern. These climatic patterns, we have a, a lots of topography. And then we've got this um, ever-dynamic vegetation that really makes um, fire complex. It's not, it's not very, um, very simple. You know, in, in some other places where you have, you know, like a very short summer, you, you know exactly like Alaska is going to have a very short fire season because um, there's only a certain part of the year where it's even just warm enough to burn. So it, it's things like that where you know, California is so dynamic and so different in some spots that um, it's definitely fire is just a complex thing to deal with. And then we've got uh, uh, anthropogenic uh, alteration or human-induced alteration of the ecosystem, which is accelerating change. So in the last 200 years, we've been really uh, accelerating change much more than, than uh, had been previously. The, uh, in terms of what makes fire um, really stand out uh, is this continuous feedback loop. So um, fire and fuels and vegetation, right? Fire needs fuel to burn. That's, that's one of the, we know that from um, both, our, uh, both our fire triangle and our fire behavior triangle. We need, it needs something to burn. So um, but what's interesting is that fire then also drives the vegetation patterns because of how um, how the fire burns and how often the fire burns in some of these areas. So you have this continuous feedback loop of um, fuels building up and then the fire um, taking it and then the fuels building up and the fire taking it. And sometimes the fire is going to take it all and sometimes it's going to take half and sometimes it's going to take very little and it, and it really depends on where you are and how that system has evolved over the, over, you know, thousands and millions of years of vegetation buildup, fire, vegetation buildup, fire, vegetation buildup, fire. 
And if you say to yourself, well, you know, how do we, how do we really know, know that? Or how do we really know, um, what we're seeing in terms of, of that fire buildup? What you really got to think about is the idea of, um, what are we seeing lately? Right? Because we've decided to change things lately. So we've decided to, to alter it and we decided to say, you know what, we don't want these fires. We don't want a lot of fires. We're going to just, you know, we're going to get rid of as many fires as possible. Now what's happening? A lot of buildup of fuel, big, huge fires, right? Well, wait a minute. That, but we know there's been fires in California in the past, but they're not always big fires. There's, there's, we're small fires and we can look at the fire scars and the fire records and all these things and find out, oh yeah, there weren't like, big huge fires all the time some of these were just little fires but we've decided to eliminate as many fires as we can and so it's really important to understand that that fire is going to affect uh, an ecosystem there's this there is a continuous loop the fuels build up fire breaks it down because decomposition doesn't have a huge role in our ecosystems in california and so because of that Fire is going to affect ecosystem function. It's going to influence fuel patterns. It's going to change ecosystem properties. It's going to change species composition, which we've seen a lot with the idea of a lot of non-native uh, invasive species now coming in because the ecosystem is basically saying, well, I know we're going to burn a lot, and these species are more competitive and more uh, uh, not adjusted, but... Uh, uh, basically they're, they're prepared for, they're prepared to deal with fire adapted. They're, that's the word I was looking for. They are adapted to fire. And so you get, you get that, you get a, even changes in vegetation structure, which we'll talk about when we, um, go to, um, fire and plant interactions, where it's the idea of, well, why do the trees and the grasses look the way that they look here? You know, why do our pines for the most part have thick bark? to them. Why do redwoods have such thick bark to them? And, and that, that structure of the vegetation, the way that the actual vegetation grows is because it's there to deal with, with fire. The idea of why are some pine cones open when some, some pine cones closed. It all has to deal with knowing that fire is part of the ecosystem, knowing that there's this continuous feedback loop, and knowing that it's, it's just, they're going to just wait and sit there and, and use fire for it's good instead of um, seeing it as a negative. So in terms of classic succession theory, so um, it, I discuss succession in both natural resources and uh, intro to forestry, but just the idea of how we go um, through the cycles, so going through um, the pattern of having a disturbance, um, having it grow back, and eventually um, we get it to where um, we get back all the way back to a a new stand or we're waiting for that next disturbance to kind of reset the cycle. So in terms of our classic successional theories, um, it's fire was always seen as a subclimatic thing. It's always seen as this disturbance that then can reset the cycle, but it's it was never seen as a climax. It was seen as something that could prevent um, an area from getting to the climax um, and that's that's been the classic successional theory um, just in case uh, you haven't taken those classes from me or you're currently taking those classes from me succession the way we define it is the predictable directional stepwise progression of plant assemblages or the idea of the replacement of one plant community by another in an organized uh, pattern and so that's what happened. That's that's our idea of classic successional theory. So then, um, if we want to take a kind of a look at that, and I'll do my best to move myself out of the way like that. So you get a fire right here um, in this this specific ponderosa pine fuel model. So for zero to nine years, it might look like that. You get your stand initiation phase happening about 10 to 24 years in you get your stem exclusion phase so that's where you get all the little ones competing for yourself and our um, in intra specific competition gets really high here and we kind of find out who are the winners and who are the losers and that happens for 25 to 59 years for 60 to 
from 60 to 99 years, we get our understory reinitiation where we get the little guys, all the, all the ones that died out, they drop away and all these little guys come in. We get a young for, uh, multi-story, story forest for 100 to 159 years and then 160 years over, we have, um, what would be considered the old forest multi-story or the old growth, um, kind of phase of, uh, of our, uh, our, uh, succession. The words aren't coming fast to me today, but I'll do my best. But this is, I wanted, I put this in here because, uh, I know I've, I've put the concept out there before in my other classes, but wanted to really give you guys actual pictures and actual, um, years to really show you kind of what it looks like out there on the landscape. So, because it's, I think it's really important too when dealing with fire to, you know, if somebody, if you're a consultant and you're on somebody's land and they say, you know, um, what am I looking at here? What's it going to be like? You know, if, if a fire comes like what the creek fire that we had up in the Sierras right now, I would tell somebody, if you don't have any reason to go to your land, I wouldn't go to your land for the next decade because you're just going to be depressed for the next decade. But after that, you're going to start seeing something, right? And so it's uh, it's the same thing I tell people uh, if I do a prescribed burn on their land or if you do logging on their land. It's like, you know, well, what, what, do, what, what should I see? What am I looking at? It's like, you know, don't come back here for three years. You know, give it some time to, to, to rest up and really show you what it can be. So then disturbance theory. Um, now disturbance, if you're sitting there going, well, I thought disturbance is part of succession. Yeah. Disturbance is part of succession, but there's also, um, in terms of just theories out there, there was, uh, specifically, uh, disturbance theory that's, uh, a little bit separate from successional theory. So, um, just in case we need, uh, a reminder, a disturbance is any relatively discrete event in time that disrupts ecosystem community or population structure and changes resources, substrate avail availability, or the physical environment. And that's the, that part's really, uh, key in my mind is, um, in the other classes, I just, um, uh, I, uh, simplify it to be just any relatively discrete event in time that disrupts the ecosystem. But really it's that, that disruption causes a change in the resources or the substrate or the physical environment. That's really the key part to, to make it an actual disturbance. Um, so how, how does disturbance theory differ from successional theory? So in disturbance theory, um, that it's kind of theorized that the plant communities were composed of patches in various stages of development, right? So the, in basic class, classical succession theory, the idea is that, you know, you get a disturbance and the whole area starts over again. Whereas disturbance theory comes in and says, well, but yeah, it's that, but on smaller scales in, in little patches. And that's why everything is so, uh, mosaic. And I use this picture on the right here, um, from the Klamath to kind of, uh, um, show the point that they're trying to make where, you know, if you have the fire burning and it just burns in these little areas, right, that's not really going to affect this area over here unless this turns into a bigger fire and burns this whole thing, you know, this might just stay the same. So it's the idea that li patch, little patches at time might um, change so that, so it's, it's much more dynamic in, in both time and space, the length that something happens as well as the area that something happens in. Um, still, still the same idea though, that it's initiated by some form of disturbance. Um, but, um, for them, disturbance can be as small as the death of a single tree or a group of trees. Or like in this case of this picture here, you know, a, a small ridge of shrubs instead of the whole mountainside of shrubs. Um, and that, uh, definitely still though the idea of fire as that, as a disturbance, as that, uh, inherent ecological process. Um, but what's also important with disturbance, um, uh, regimes, uh, at least in terms of, um, 
our use of this idea is that it uh, they they actually came up with regimes. So they they came up uh, with regimes based on frequency, size, and magnitude. So that when people started studying fire and and really getting into fire, this is where we start to kind of um, put together some of those ideas to really think about well, what about fire regimes? Can we classify um, fires by the way that they are, or by the places that they're in, or what what can we what can we, how could we classify fire? We kind of start getting to those ideas. And then there's also hierarchical theory. So with hierarchical, hierarchical theory, the idea is that the ecosystem is a dual organization determined by structural constraints on organisms and functional constraints on processes. And they have both spatial and temporal components. So basically there's things in the ecosystem that affect how much space the the ecosystem takes up or how much space things within the ecosystem take up and there's also temporal components so things that will change over time so things that will change in space and change in time so for instance a tree right um, we have a fire or some sort of disturbance and a new tree starts that tree is going to be this big at some point and it's going to be this big then it's going to be this big. Then it's going to be this big at some point in time, right? It's going to be um, 3 inches tall, 12 inches tall, 4 feet tall, 8 feet tall, 25 feet tall, 150 feet tall. If it's a redwood, 275 feet tall, right? So it's going to change in in space, the space that it needs, the space that it takes up. It's also going to change in time in that it's it's growing and it'll change the ecosystem, right? Because that tree just needs a little bit when it's very small. By the time, if it's a redwood and it's 250 feet tall, it's going to need a lot um, from the ecosystem. And it's going to provide a lot to the ecosystem. It's going to provide wildlife habitat. It's going to provide nutrients into the soil. It's going to provide shade and... Um, and um, um, food for the for the um, for the wildlife as well in terms of of leaves and cones and that sort of thing so it's really it's really important to understand this idea that just um, in terms of hierarchical theory that they that it's this idea that the ecosystem changes in in space and time constantly and that's that leads to that dynamic nature of the ecosystem that we talk about all the time um, another kind of important idea from hierarchical theory is that Fire, when viewed at a scale appropriate to frequency um, of occurrence, uh, shows that it's an essential eco ecosystem prof process that retains spatial diversity of the landscape and permits reaching a dynamic equilibrium after disturbance. Now, if you say to yourself, I don't know what he said, let me make it a lot simpler, okay? Fire, when viewed at a scale appropriate to the frequency of occurrence. So if we look at a stand of trees let's say let's say you own some some ranch land out in the sierra right if we if we if there's a fire that comes through you're like oh my god my all my land is burned all my land is gone it's all burned up and it's sad and and it sucks no doubting that but how did that affect the actual ecosystem, right? Your ranch, unless you are somebody like Ted Turner, whose whole ranch might encompass a whole ecosystem, um, is only one small space within that ecosystem. And in terms of looking at the whole ecosystem, maybe that's just that's just one patch that needed to to go at that time. And so, let's take this example. And let's try to really put it put it into play. Let's talk about like ponderosa pine uh, forests, right? Uh, got plenty of ponderosa pine up in the Sierra Nevadas and up in um, northeastern California as well. If you look at the right here, this is the range of ponderosa pine um, within North America. And so, if I get a burn that happens right here, like the Creek Fire, and burns up Shaver and Bass Lake. Um, areas, right? That's that's terrible. That's horrible. People are losing homes and all that. 
But if I try and put that into the context of the ponderosa pine ecosystem just within the Sierra Nevada alone, it's only a, a very small fraction of that ecosystem. And so it's it's important when we try to understand fire and and it's really hard now because of the human element that we've brought in to to fire instead of trying to think of it at the ecosystem level is that fire seems like this destructive force and that you know it's wiping everything out but really if you think about it in turn and just try and um, change the scale of your thinking to the ponderosa pine ecosystem of california look at this green patch right that's not the creek fire was like a dot over there even though it was huge it was just like a little it's a little dot over here and so it's it's the idea that um that we if we really want to look at it um ecosystem wise and look at and try and judge what it what does fire do in the ecosystem or how does it affect the ecosystem it really changes our view because we change the scale that we're looking at it at. And so let's talk about um, the role of fire within ecosystems and the idea of um, what goes into a fire regime. And so um, in terms of fire regimes, we de we've defined this before, but let's define it again to make sure that people aren't confused. So fire regimes are complex patterns of fire effects or the complex pattern of fire effects over long periods of time, multiple fire events, and numerous ecosystem properties, right? The idea that there's all these things within the ecosystem and these different fire events, like you can see in this picture on the right, and over long periods of time, that then we try and look at that, put all that together, and come up with what is what, what do we expect in general to happen in this area. So in general, a fire regime characterizes the spatial and temporal patterns think about those theories we just talked about and and how that idea where we pulled that idea from and ecosystem impacts a fire on the landscape so how do things change in space and time and how does it uh, impact the ecosystem so why why do we want to come up with fire regimes why do we care about this this classification of fire regimes and it really comes down to the idea of having a convenient and useful way to classify, describe, and categorize the pattern of occurrence. The problem is it, it does vary greatly um, within vegetation type and over time. And if you change things, then it changes. So, you know, if we say, um, you know, that like looking at the right here, it's real simplified, right? Frequent surface fires in grasslands. Why? Because there's a continuous fuel bed here. You've got a continuous supply of oxygen, so you've got fuel and oxygen. All you need is the heat part. You'll get fire, right? Frequent surface fires here in dry forests. Now, are, would you expect there to be more um, fires here in the grasslands or more fires here in the forest? It, now, if you say can vary with very greatly with vegetation type, this is where I go. Yeah, it depends. And you go, well, what do you mean it depends? And it's like, well, you could get more fires in the forest than you can get in the grasslands. And you sit there and maybe you go, well, why? And you go, well, think about it. Those trees are going to be dropping uh, needles all the time. So you've got not only do you have the grass, but you have the needles. So you, now you have two um, fuel sources. Now the thing is you're not going to have as much oxygen as you do on the grassland. So maybe this burns a little more patchier and more of a mosaic and this burns a much just bigger contiguous area but maybe you get the same amount of fires in these areas and so it's all sorts of little things like that, that you have to think about all the time and and kind of think about it and you say well uh, that's kind of that'll get complicated because there could be a lot of things that go into it and you're right there are a lot of things that go into it and so when we really start to think about fire regimes and we really start to think about our different um, our different bioregions, and you can see those here, um, and, and just kind of here's at least just national forest-wise of a comparison. Um, you can see the national forests in California 
what bioregions they fall into and the different kind of um, species that you would expect in those bioregions. So already we know we're dealing with different bioregions, so they're going to have um, different climate patterns, different topography. Um, we know that um, in different, um, in looking at this map, different fuel types as well. And so we know um, this is this right here is the way to think about fire regimes, right? We know we can get a fire if we get fuel, heat, and oxygen. We know that the fire is going to behave differently um, depending on the weather, the topographies, and the fuels of the area. But what we want to get is we want to get to this um, idea of a fire regime where we understand the climate, we understand the ignition patterns, and we understand the vegetation in the area so that we can um, really understand what we're dealing with or what to expect on a daily basis uh, in a given area. And so that's what we're trying to get to. We're trying to get to a basic understanding. Up up here in the Sierras, you got mixed conifer forest for the most part, the uh, largest area of mixed conifer forest in the in the world. So you're you're having a lot of different tree species to actually deal with, but they all kind of react the same way to fire, and that's why we call it mixed conifer. That's why we don't try and say, well, this is a chunk of ponderosa, and this is a chunk of Jeffrey, and this is a chunk of sugar pine we're just going to be like you know what they all they all can kind of um, have the same same reaction and grow in the same way and so we're trying to find groupings we're trying to find similarities to try and make this easy to understand so that we can we can get a get a grasp and really try and do our best to figure out how to how to best deal with fire in the ecosystem and so let's Oh, we'll go over um, just quickly the kind of the previous uh, fire regime descriptions that existed, and then uh, we'll go over the attributes that uh, that really uh, help shape uh, fire in the ecosystem. And so um, this map, at least uh, when I was uh, sitting in your chairs, was one I saw uh, quite a bit in terms of the idea of what are the fire regimes for the United States? And so it was grouped into these five groups um, based on uh, the idea of um, frequency and severity. So um, group one, frequent with low severity. Group two, frequent high severity. Um, group three, moderate frequency, low severity. Group four, moderate frequency, high severity. Group five, infrequent. So let's start with the easy one, infrequent, right? Deserts, rainforests, um, areas that get lots of snow and aren't very warm. Seems pretty easy to understand there. So what about um, frequent high severity too? Lots of this is grassland, grassland and small trees. Well, what's really easy to... Um, have big, huge fires in areas that have um, continuous fuels, areas where you can get a lot of oxygen. So, um, you know, you get good wind going through this area. You got long stretches of grasslands, easy to have um, frequent fires and have them be high severity where, you know, you burn up everything. Then in here where you get... Um, a lot of changes in topography, you get changes in fuels, um, you end up with the moderate frequency, um, but usually low severity. That's because some of it's um, up at high altitude, some of it's low altitude, so sometimes you get big stuff, sometimes you get small stuff. And um, But look at California here, frequent low severity fires, at least historically, that's what it was. It was a lot of fires, but low severity. You're not killing a lot of trees, you're not changing composition and structure of places. Our California is used to having lots of fires, but lots of fires that, that burn small and, and don't really destroy the ecosystem. So here's a um, comparison of previous classifications. So when you read the book, you'll read about Heinzelman, you'll read about Hardy, and you'll read about Kilgore, and this is just a comparison of all of them. So these ones were the ones um, kind of that we that we were just looking at the idea of um, uh, 
or the sorry the map that we were just looking at was kind of a, a combination of it's the it's the Heinzelin, the Kilgore and Hardy kind of put together so it's the idea of the frequency and then um, the severity of the fire uh, as well as the um, you know what kind of fires you can you can expect in these areas and so it's um, there's there's been a lot of different ways to classify it and there wasn't um, one agreed upon uh, way of looking at fire regimes and and I don't know that there still is technically agreed upon way but certainly the authors of our book which um, and there's there's a lot of people who went into the making of that book so there's there's some agreement there on just the ideas of what what makes up a uh, a fire regime but here's just another look at it let me move myself uh, down here out of the way right just here's another uh, kind of uh, putting together of it so you get five groups you get here's frequency here's severity and what is uh, meant by that severity and you can kind of see it's a little different right so fire regime two where you get the the replacement level right because these are grasses so you can really easily burn up uh you know a blade of grass and so it's um this the severity of this would be uh high severity or replacement and so it's just kind of a mixing of the terminology to really make it uh, more more clear you can see california there's a little bit of one and three in there where you get the mixed low and the um and the low mix because sometimes you get a little more severity and sometimes you don't and here in the central valley indeterminate fire characteristics because it just doesn't happen because the area is covered by agriculture and people and then um in the 90s we get um jim Agee, who back when i was in school that was like the fire guy to me he came up with a fire regime classification just a more simplistic model based on severity and so if you look at um at the proportion of uh fires so you know lots of fires uh, medium amount of fires high amount of fires and you look at the severity you can you can just put together a basic model so if i get a high amount of fires and a high if i can if i can get um fires you can go you can have a high amount of fires and you can have low severity and you can have a high amount of fires and you can have high severity if you have a low amount of fires and low severity there's there's a much more um much more of a chance that if you have a low amount of fires you're going to have low severity if you have um, a high amount of fires your severity starts to just go up because if you keep having fires and keep having fires and keep having fires you're going to eventually burn everything up and if you have a moderate amount of fires you know sometimes it'll be low severity sometimes it'll be high severity most of the time it's probably going to be somewhere in the middle and that's how you just kind of read read that chart the idea that we're talking about the amount of fires versus the severity right so going over it one more time if i have a high amount of fires yeah i can have low severity but the more amount of uh, fires i have the more severity i'm going to see if i have a low amount of fires and i can get a lot of low severity if i've got a low amount of fires because just there's not that many fires happening not that many fires happening now i think uh, what's interesting is i think this graph will change if depending on your fuel source because what we've been seeing lately is that buildup of fuels so we may be having this low um, it's a low amount of fires but we're actually having high severity so we're actually experiencing this part so even though it's a low amount of fires you can still get high severity and that's what we're seeing right now with things like the campfire and the creek fire and the the complexes uh, up north of the bay area and so let's talk about attribute based fire regimes because um, it's really it's a framework that expands on all these previous fire regime classifications and the the theories uh, the ecological theories from before uh it's it, and it really tries to take um ag's variation that we just talked about and really just say like let's keep it 
simple. Let's let's try not to go too complicated. Let's really look at um, what's most important to ecosystem function. And so they found seven attributes of fire regime that are really important to ecosystem function. And so those are broken up into three categories. So those three categories are temporal. It will change over time. Space, it will change um, in the amount or the size. And then magnitude, so change in its, um, in its um, importance um, or in its uh, effect on the ecosystem. And so in terms of temporal, we've got seasonality and we've got fire return interval. Spatial, we've got the size of the fire and the spatial complexity of the fire. In terms of magnitude, we've got the fire line intensity, the fire severity, and the fire type. And so let's go into each one of those. So let me move myself here. I think that'll be good. All right, so in terms of seasonality. So when we say seasonality, all we're trying to say is when the fires occur during the year. And there's four basic patterns that we find in California. There's a spring, summer, fall. There's a summer, fall. There's a late summer, short, and a late summer, fall. And so the spring, summer, fall pattern, that's the longest fire season type. It's uh, made in November, but we really only see this in the southeastern deserts by our region. And so if you look here, our solid line, that's spring, summer, fall. And so you can see that from March to December, that place is ready to burn. However, it's the it's the southeastern desert, so there's just not a whole lot available out there to burn. Most of California falls into the summer, fall. So if we look at um, at the uh, this um, it's what would what would it be dash dot dot the dash dot dot one right here this is what we really see in terms of our normal fire season for the majority of California so you're talking about April after green up we got this big proportion of burned areas happening till about November then the rains come back in and um, and then it's um, then we're that's kind of our fire season. We really see the majority of this July to October, most of the actions. And the majority of rangelands and forests in California fall under this summer fall pattern. There's also a late summer short pattern, um, which we see with the dashes uh, on here, right there. And that's from July to September, but that's only in uh, ecosystems where you find, uh, or places within ecosystems where you find sparse and discontinuous fuels. Uh, and then you have the late summer fall pattern, um, which here is the dash dot right there. And that one is, um, you find that in Central Coast and South Coast Chaparral. So think about um, all the stuff in terms of um, the coast and down LA area, the stuff um, in the grapevine, right? When do we hear about that stuff? It's usually late summer, fall. We don't hear about those those things burning in June or July usually. And that uh, also comes with the influence of the Santa Ana winds. In terms of fire return interval, that's our uh, second of our two temporal attributes. Um, fire return interval or FRI is the length of time between fires on a particular um, area of land. So we got five or five, sorry, six categories here. My fault, can't count. Truncated short, short, truncated medium, medium, truncated long, and long. And so what does that mean? So truncated short, all of the areas born with a short fire return interval. So truncated short is the, um, the solid line right here. And that is the idea that um, within the uh, within this particular piece of land, it's always short uh, fire return intervals, right? So you can see in terms of years, always between uh, zero and twenty. It's never going to be like there's one that one fire where it came, you know, eighty years later. No, within twenty years, you're always going to have another fire in those areas. Short fire return interval. So that's the dashes here. Right, that guy right there. Most of the area burns with a short fire return interval, but you, sometimes you're going to get, and you can see that line goes out to here. Sometimes you can get it to where it's going to just not burn for a while, but the majority of the time, right, because this is where it's highest on the y axis, 
the majority of the time it's going to burn with that short, you know, um, 25 years and less um, fire return interval. And this um, this will help maintain the open nature of stands. So if you have places like a, a forest that also has a meadow or a grassland, that's what you need. That's why in Yosemite, um, people talk about the beauty of Yosemite Valley, but how it's being um, encroached on with a lot of fur lately. It's because it hasn't been burning the way that it should on its fire return interval. So we're losing some of the grasslands in Yosemite Valley because it's not on this short fire return interval anymore. With medium, and with truncated medium and medium, you get um, a range of fire return intervals, and they can be, you know, few few years to several decades. When we talk about truncated long, which is this one um, here, you're talking about uh, this one right there. You're talking about greater than 70 years, and that this is areas where you just don't get you get discontinued fuels or um, places that just don't really see fire or aren't adapted to fire. And with the long ones where you get a long fire return and a long time between fires, it's just areas that are usually geographically isolated and just don't get fire. Fire size. So when we talk about size, we're talking about the characteristic distribution of the total area within a fire perimeter. So we've got truncated, small, small, medium, and large. So truncated, small, less than two and a half acres of um, burned of total area within the fire perimeter. So when we say a truncated small fire, we're saying that there's two and a half acres of um, area got burned. When we say a small fire, we're saying 25 acres, medium 25 to 2,500, large greater than 2,500 acres. And so what's the difference between these places? Truncated small, the ecosystems are usually spatial, spatially limited or have discontinued fuels. Small, um, you have extensive open woodlands with sparse fuel, right? You don't have that nice contiguous fuel bed. Medium, you get patchy fuel conditions. So some places it's going to burn well, some places it's not going to burn great. That's why we see a lot of fires in this 25 to 2500 kind of range. But then large fires, the greater than 2500, extensive areas with continuous fuels. And this is what really um, stands out to us because we know that we've been getting these big, huge stand replacing fires lately in California. And if that's the case, that means we have these extensive areas with continuous fuels because that's how you get a fire to be of that size. And so that should really stand out to us because I think in the history of California, it's much more been a lot of fires in this area, in this size area, the small and medium, that have made up a large amount of acres whereas now we're just saying all right we're gonna burn it all in one shot because we have enough fuel to make these huge runs and that's that's a big thing that's um, to us as uh, fire ecologists that we kind of find disturbing that people just don't understand that if you get a fire this big it's not, it there's fire is is simplistic in a way right fuel heat and oxygen that means it's it was hot that means there was plenty of oxygen because there always is. And so that, but that means that there was also continuous fuels and that the fuels part is something we really got to address if we don't want to have these large stand replacing fires. Spatial complexity. Slide myself down. Well, slide myself in here. Yeah, that's easy. So, um, with spatial complexity, Complexity. We're talking about the pattern of burned and unburned areas within the fire perimeter at different severities. So when you say low spatial complexity, we're talking about it being mostly homogeneous, where it, the the burned or unburned it looks the same, right? So, um, well, what do you mean? So if you have a low spatial complexity, you're basically saying everything happen the same. So uh, usually that would be like a grassland, right? The whole thing just kind of burns off and it's just one big patch of black, right? Whereas if we're talking about high spatial complexity or moderate spatial complexity, we're talking about, um, you know, we'll look at this island of unburned fuel here and look at this. Um, well, that whole area didn't burn, right? Um, when you go to some of these neighborhoods uh, that that burned up after a wildfire, you're like, oh, look at this whole block is done. And then there's a whole nother block where it's still there. 
and then there's um, you know this one house made up of then all these other ten houses didn't and it's that same idea but in the forest right this tree was fine this tree wasn't this whole area of trees torched this whole area of grass torched this area of shrubs didn't burn at all and so if we have high spatial complexity we got lots of different things happening where it's you know sometimes it burned sometimes it didn't if you got it low everything looks the same either it all burned up or it all didn't really burn up and moderate is in between now this is where we get the um, introduction of the multiple category where some of these areas because of the way that the fuel and vegetation is you can have multiple patterns happening um, which uh, was kind of common I think more historically where you get um, uh, like you'd have the tall forest with the grassland underneath, right? So you could get the grassland burning to where everything in the understory burns up, but nothing really happened in the overstory. And so you can kind of get these, to, um, you can have areas where you have multiple spatial complexities to it. And, you know, sometimes um, have it to be where you have different fire regimes going on at the same time in the same area. So in terms of fire line intensity, so fire line intensity being the measure of energy release rate per unit length of fire line. So you can have low, moderate, high, and then that multiple category of fire line intensity. When we say low, you're talking about flame lengths less than four feet. You're talking about surface fire. It stays on the surface and um, it will consume vegetation, but it won't. you won't get complete consumption in a low intensity fire. Moderate intensity, flame lengths four to eight feet. The fire still remains on the surface, but you can get complete consumption of some areas to where, you know, you get that whole black moonscape kind of look. High intensity uh, fires, flame lengths are going to be greater than 8 feet. You're going to get crowning, spotting, and major runs like what we see with these big, huge stand replacing fires, Camp Fire, Creek Fire, the complexes up in Northern California. You get complete consumption and mortality of the above ground vegetation. Everything gets moonscaped. And then the idea of multiple, where you get both low intensity surface fires, but you can also get high intensity crown fires as well. Severity. Severity now, it's a word you've heard me, heard me say quite a bit um, when we've been talking about fire regimes. So severity, we're talking about the magnitude of the effect that fire has on the environment and severity um, is taken from the idea of how intense was the fire how long was the fire in that area the residence time and then the moisture conditions was it really dry was it was it wet it kind of it the, all those the combination of those things will affect the severity and so um, we've got low severity moderate severity high severity very high severity and then the multiple severity so with low severity, slight to no modification of the vegetation, um, moderate, you get most of the individual mature plants surviving, right? So you, you can, it, let's say you burn in a forest, you know, the majority of the trees in that forest will be fine. You'll lose some, but the most of them will be there. If you get high severity, you get uh, above ground parts of most individual plants killed. So in that case, same forest, if you had a high severity fire, you'd just have a few trees that were surviving, but the majority of them would be dead. Very high, that's what we get into that terminology of stand replacing, where everything's gone. And that's what you've seen in um, areas of the of the creek fire and the camp fire and, the, and those complexes where you get this, this stand replacing events. And then multiple would be a mixture of uh, having um, low severity and high severity fires. And then fire type. So when we say fire type, we're saying the description of the flaming front patterns that are characteristic to that ecosystem or to uh, whichever ecosystem we're describing. So you got surface passive, passive active crown, active independent crown, and multiple. So when we say surface passive crown, for that fire type, you can have up to 30% of the area may experience torching. So when we say torching, we're saying that's where one tree gets burned up or a group of trees get burned up, but not the, the whole stand or the whole forest, just one or a group of trees um, together. Actually, it could be a whole stand of trees, but you know, within the larger look of the forest, it's still a small group of trees. 
your passive active crown fire type, that's where you get the pending crown fire. So you need a surface fire, but then that surface fire will get up into the um, the crowns of the trees and move with the surface fire. Um, this this is what you see in um, a lot of places lately because um, the idea that the active crown fire is increasing in recent years with uh, human alteration to the to the ecosystem, and then you get active independent crown fires. So. If you have active independent ground fires in terms of fire type, that's where you can get a, a fire that um, is burning in the crowns independent of surface fire or even in advance of the surface fire. You get your crowns are getting wiped out and then this slower moving surface fire comes along afterwards. And so those are the three different fire types. And then you get multiple where you basically just have some sort of combination of surface fire and crown fire happening in that area. And so those are our attributes. And so to kind of just sum it all up, fire has predictable spatial, temporal, and magnitude patterns within an ecosystem. Species persist in these fire-prone ecosystems because they have characteristics that make them competitive with recurring fire. And we're going to cover that in detail um, when we get to fire and plant interactions in Chapter 8. Uh, ecosystems will adjust to changes in fire regime. They'll change the competition composition and the structure they'll migrate upslope downslope they'll go north and south though they will adjust to try and survive because just like everything we know with nature it, it's all a competition and it's all about uh adaptation uh change has been accelerated in the last 200 years in terms of ecosystems and fire because of human alteration um, what we've really seen here in california is less small low intensity fires uh, leading to these larger stand replacing fires due to a buildup of fuels and a change in the uh, in the composition and structure of the vegetation within the ecosystem. Uh, we do know managing fire is going to be a major element of managing the ecosystem. And what you really got to take away, or at least what I'm hoping you're going to take away from this lecture of fire as an ecological process, is that we can't eliminate fire from the landscape. It is part of the landscape. It is part of the ecosystem here in California. It is a driver of ecosystem and ecosystem change. And we really need to appreciate that and really need to understand its role to be able to um, use it in the best way forward to really um, have an ecosystem that works for us, but then also works for all of the species um, living within that ecosystem so that we can live in the best place possible and we can really live in these these beautiful areas that we love and appreciate and aren't trying to um, burn everything up inside of it because we know fire is part of it but if we can burn a lot of little fires that's going to be just as good to the ecosystem or even maybe even better than one of these big, huge stand replacing events. But we have to understand and we have to make a decision. Which one of those are we, we more comfortable with? Because it's going to happen one way or the other. Hope you enjoyed it.